9. Hungry and trembling, James stood alone out in the open, wondering what to do. The night was all around him now, and high overhead in a wild, a wild white moon was riding in the sky. There was not a sound, not of movement anywhere. Most people, especially small children, are often scared of being out of doors alone in the moonlight. Everything is so deadly quiet, and the shadows are so long and black, and they keep turning into strange shapes that seem to move as you look at them, and the slightest little snap of a twig makes you jump. James felt exactly like that now. He stared straight ahead with large, frightened eyes, hardly daring to breathe. Not far away, in the middle of the garden, he could see the peach or the giant peach towering over everything else. Surely it was even bigger tonight than ever before. And what a dazzling sight it was. The moonlight was shining and glinting on its great curving sides, turning them to crystal and silver. It looked like a tremendous silver ball lying there in the grass, silent, mysterious, and wonderful. And then all at once, Little shivers of excitement started running over the skin on James' back. Something else, he told himself. Something stranger than ever this time is about to happen to me again soon. He was sure of it. He could feel it coming. He looked around him wondering what on earth it was going to be. The garden lay soft and silver in the moonlight. The grass was wet with dew and a million dewdrops were sparkling and twinkling like diamonds around his feet. And now suddenly, the whole place, the whole garden, seemed to be alive with magic. Almost without knowing what he was doing, as though drawn by some powerful magnet, James Henry Trotter started walking slowly towards the giant peach. He climbed over the fence that surrounded it and stood directly beneath it, staring up at its great bulging sides. He put out a hand and touched it gently with the tip of one finger. It felt soft and warm and slightly furry, like the skin of a baby mouse. He moved a step closer and rubbed his cheek lightly against the soft skin. And then suddenly, while he was doing this, he happened to notice that right beside him and below him, close to the ground, there was a hole in the side of the peach. Chapter 10. It was quite a large hole, the sort of thing an animal about the size of a fox might have made. James knelt down in front of it and poked his head and shoulders inside. He crawled in. He kept on crawling. This isn't a hole, he thought excitedly. It's a tunnel. The tunnel was damp and murky, and all around him there was the curious, bittersweet smell of fresh peach. The floor was soggy under his knees. The walls were wet and sticky, and the peach juice was dripping from the ceiling. James opened his mouth and caught some of it on his tongue. It tasted delicious. He was crawling uphill now, as though the tunnel were leading straight towards the very center of the gigantic fruit. Every few seconds, he paused and took a bite out of the wall. The peach flesh was sweet and juicy and marvelously refreshing. He crawled on for several more yards and then suddenly, bang! The top of his head bumped into something extremely hard, blocking his way. He glanced up. In front of him, there was a solid wall that seemed as, at first as though it were made of wood. He touched it with his fingers. It certainly felt like wood except that it was very jagged and full of deep grooves. Good heavens, he said. I know what this is. I've come to the stone in the middle of the peach. Then he noticed there was a small door cut into the face of the peach stone. He gave a push. It swung open. He crawled through it, and before he had time to glance up and see where he was, he heard a voice saying, Look who's here! And another one said, we've been waiting for you. 
James stopped and stared at the speakers, his face white with horror. He started to stand up, but his knees were shaking so much he had to sit down and get on the floor. He glanced behind him, thinking he could bolt back into the tunnel the way he had come. But the doorway had disappeared. There was now only a solid brown wall behind him. Chapter 11 James' large, frightened eyes traveled slowly around the room. The creatures, some sitting on chairs, others reclining on a sofa, were all watching him intently. Creatures? Or were they insects? An insect is usually something rather small, is it not? A grasshopper, for example, is an insect. So what would you call it if you saw a grasshopper as large as a dog? As large as a large dog, you could hardly call that an insect, could you? There was an old green grasshopper as large as a large dog sitting directly across the room from James now. And next to the old green grasshopper, there was an enormous spider. <clears throat> and, next to the <coughs> and next to the spider, there was a giant ladybird with nine black spots on her scarlet shell. Each of these three was squatting upon a magnificent chair. On a sofa, ne sofa nearby, reclining comfortably in curled up positions, there were a centipede and an earthworm. On the floor over in the far corner, there was something thick and white that looked as though it might be a silkworm, but it was sleeping soundly and nobody was paying any attention to it. <clears throat> Every one of these creatures was at least as big as James himself. And in the strange greenish light that shone down from somewhere in the ceiling, they were absolutely terrifying to behold. I'm hungry, the spider announced suddenly, staring hard at James. I'm famished, the old green grasshopper said. So am I, the ladybird cried. The centipede sat up a little straighter on the sofa. Everyone's famished, he said. We need food. Four pairs of round, black, glassy eyes were all fixed upon James. The centipede made a wriggling movement with his body as though he were about to glide off the sofa, but he didn't. There was a long pause and a long silence. The spider, who happened to be a female spider, opened her mouth and ran a long black tongue delicately over her lips. Aren't you hungry? She asked suddenly, leaning forward and addressing herself to James. Poor James was backed up against the far wall, shivering with fright and much too terrified to answer. What's the matter with you? The old green grasshopper asked. You look positively ill. He looks as though he's going to faint any second, the centipede said. Oh my goodness, the poor thing, the ladybird cried. I do believe he thinks it's him that we are wanting to eat. There was a roar of laughter from all sides. Oh dear, oh dear, they said. What an awful thought. You mustn't be frightened, the ladybird said kindly. We wouldn't dream of hurting you. You are one of us now. Didn't you know that? You are one of the crew. We're all in the same boat. We've been waiting for you all day long, the old green grasshopper said. We thought you were never going to turn up. I'm glad you made it. So cheer up, my boy, cheer up, the centipede said. And meanwhile, I wish you'd come over here and give me a hand with these boots. It takes me hours to get them off, get them all off by myself. Chapter 12. James decided that this was most certainly not a time to be disagreeable. So he crossed the room to where the centipede was sitting and knelt down beside him. Thank you so much, the centipede said. You are very kind. You have a lot of boots, James murmured. I have a lot of legs, the centipede answered proudly. And a lot of feet. One hundred to be exact. There he goes again the earthworm cried, speaking for the first time. He simply cannot stop telling lies about his legs. He doesn't have anything like a hundred of them. He's only up 42. 
The trouble is that most people don't bother to count them. They just take his word. And anyway, there is nothing marvelous, you know, centipede, about having a lot of legs. Poor fellow, the centipede said, whispering in James' ears. He's blind. He can't see how splendid I look. In my opinion, the earthworm said, the really marvelous thing is to have no legs at all and to be able to walk just the same. You call that walking? cried the centipede. You're the slitherer. That's all you are. You just slither along. I glide, said the earthworm primly. You are a slimy beast, answered the centipede. I am not a slimy beast, the earthworm said. I am a useful and much loved creature. Ask any gardener you like. And as for you, I am a pest, the centipede announced, grinning broadly and looking round the room for approval. He is so proud of that, the ladybird said, smiling at James. Though, for the life of me, I cannot understand why. I am the only pest in this room, cried the centipede, still grinning away. Unless you count old green grasshopper over there, but he is long past it now. He is too old to be a pest anymore. The old green grasshopper turned his huge black eyes upon the centipede and gave him a withering look. Young fellow, he said, speaking in a deep, slow, scornful voice. I have never been a pest in my life. I am a musician. Hear, hear, said the ladybird. James, the centipede said. Your name is James, isn't it? Yes. Well, James, have you ever in your life seen such a marvelous, colossal centipede as me? I certainly haven't, James answered. How on earth did you get to be like that? Very peculiar, the centipede said. Very, very peculiar indeed. Let me tell you what happened. I was messing around in the garden under the old peach tree, and suddenly a funny little green thing came wriggling past my nose. Bright green it was, and extraordinarily beautiful, and it looked like some kind of tiny stone or crystal. Oh, but I know what that was, cried James. It happened to me too, said the ladybird. And me, Miss Spider said. Suddenly there were little green things everywhere. The soil was full of them. I actually swallowed one, the earthworm de declared proudly. So did I, the ladybird said. <clears throat> I swallowed three, the centipede cried. But who's telling this story anyway? Don't interrupt. It's too late to tell stories now the old green grasshopper announced. It's time to go to sleep. I refuse to sleep in my boots, the centipede cried. How many more are there to come off, James? I think I've done about 20 so far, James told him. Then that leaves 80 to go, the centipede said. 22, not 80, shrieked the earthworm. He's lying again. The centipede roared with laughter. Stop pulling the earthworm's leg the ladybird said. This sent the centipede into hysterics. Pulling his leg, he cried, wiggling with glee and pointing at the earthworm. Which leg am I pulling? You tell me that. James decided that he rather liked the centipede. He was obviously a rascal, but what, ch what a change it was to hear somebody laughing once in a while. He had never heard Aunt Sponge or Aunt Spiker laughing aloud in all the time he had been with them. We really must get some sleep, the old green grasshopper said. We've got a tough day ahead of us tomorrow. So would you be kind enough, Miss Spider, to make the beds? Chapter 13. A few minutes later, Miss Spider had made the first bed. It was hanging from the ceiling, suspended by a rope of threads at either end, so that actually it looked more like a hammock than a bed. But it was a magnificent affair, and the stuff that it was made of shimmered like silk in the pale light. I do hope you'll find it comfortable, Miss Spider said to the old green grasshopper. I made it as soft and silky as I possibly could. I spun it with gossamer. That's a much better quality thread than the one I use for my own web. Thank you so much, my dear lady, 
the old grain grasshopper said, climbing into the hammock. Ah, this is just what I needed. Good night, everybody. Good night. Then Miss Spider spun the next hammock and the ladybird got in. After that, she spun a long one for the centipede and an even longer one for the earthworm. And how do you like your bed? She said to James when it came to his turn. Hard or soft? I like it soft, thank you very much, James answered. For goodness sake, stop staring around the room and get on with my boots, the centipede said. You and I are never going to get any sleep at this rate. And kindly line them up neatly in pairs as you take them off. Don't just throw them over your shoulder. James worked away frantically on the centipede's boots. Each one had laces that had to be untied and loosened before it could be pulled off. And to make matters worse, all the laces were tied up in the most terrible complicated knots that had to be unpicked with fingernails. It was just awful. It took about two hours. And by the time James had pulled off the last boot of all and had lined them up in a row on the floor, 21 pairs all together, the centipede was fast asleep. Wake up, centipede, whispered James, giving him a gentle dig in the stomach. It's time for bed. Thank you, my dear child, the centipede said, opening his eyes. Then he got down off the sofa and ambled across the room and crawled into his hammock. James got into his own hammock. And oh, how soft and comfortable it was compared with the hard bare boards that his aunts had always made him sleep upon at home. Lights out, said the centipede drowsily. Nothing happened. Turn out the light, he called, raising his voice. James glanced around the room, wondering which of the others he might be talking to. But they were all asleep. The old green grasshopper was snoring loudly through his nose. The ladybird was making whistling noises as she breathed. And the earthworm was coiled up like a spring at one end of his hammock, wheezing and blowing through his open mouth. As for Miss Spider, she had made a lovely web for herself across one corner of the room and James could see her crouching right in the very center of it, mumbling softly in her dreams. I said, turn out the light, shouted the centipede angrily. Are you talking to me? James asked him. Of course I'm not talking to you, the centipede answered. That crazy glowworm has gone to sleep with her light on. For the first time since entering the room, James glanced up at the ceiling and there he saw a most extraordinary sight. Something that looked like a giant fly without wings, it was at least three feet long, was standing upside down upon its six legs in the middle of the ceiling, and the tail end of this creature seemed to be literally on fire. A brilliant greenish light as bright as the brightest electric bulb was shining out of its tail and lighting up the whole room. Is that a glowworm? asked James, staring at the light. It doesn't look like a worm of any sort to me. Of course it's a glow worm, the centipede answered. At least that's what she calls herself. Although, actually, you are quite right. She isn't really a worm at all. Glow worms are never worms. They are simply lady fireflies without wings. Wake But the glow worm didn't stir. So the centipede reached out of his hammock and picked up one of his boots from the floor. Put out that wretched light, he shouted, hurling the boot up at the ceiling. The glowworm slowly opened one eye and stared at the centipede. There is no need to be rude, she said coldly, all in good time. Come on, come on, come on, shouted the centipede, or I'll put it out for you. Oh, hello, James, the glowworm said, looking down and giving James a little wave and a smile. I didn't see you come in. Welcome, my dear boy, welcome, and good night. Then click, and out went the light. James Henry Trotter lay there in the darkness, with his eyes wide open, listening to the strange sleeping noises that the creatures were making all around him and wondering what on earth was going to happen to him in the morning. Already, he was beginning to like his new friends very much. 
They were not nearly as terrible as they looked. In fact, they weren't really terrible at all. They seemed extremely kind and helpful, in spite of all the shouting and arguing that went on between them. <clears throat> Good night, old green grasshopper, he whispered. Good night, ladybird. Good night, Miss Spider. But before he could go through them all, he had fallen fast asleep. Fourteen. We're off, someone was shouting. We're off at last. James woke up with a jump and looked about him. The creatures were all out of their hammocks and moving excitedly around the room. Suddenly, the floor gave a great heave, as though an earthquake were taking place. Here we go, shouted the old green grasshopper, hopping up and down with excitement. Hold on tight. What's happening? cried James, leaping out of his hammock. What's going on? <clears throat> the ladybird, who was obviously a kind and gentle creature, came over and stood beside him. In case you don't know it, she said, we are about to depart forever from the top of this ghastly hill that we've all been living on for so long. We are about to roll away inside this great, big, beautiful peach to a land of, 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 to a land of, of what? asked James. Never you mind, said the ladybird. But nothing could be worse than this desolate hilltop and those two repulsive ants of yours. Hear, hear, they all shouted. Hear, hear. You may not have noticed it, the ladybird went on, but the whole garden, even before it reaches the steep edge of the hill, happens to be on a steep slope. And therefore, the only thing that has been stopping this peach from rolling away right from the beginning is the thick stem attaching it to the tree. Break the stem and off we go. Watch it, cried Miss Spider, as the room gave another violent lurch. Here we go. Not quite, not quite. At this moment, continued the ladybird, our centipede, who has a pair of jaws as sharp as razors, is up there on top of the peach, nibbling away at that stem. In fact, he must be nearly through it, as you can tell from the way we're lurching about. Would you like me to take you under my wing so that you won't fall over when we start rolling? That's very kind of you, said James, but I think I'll be all right. Just then, the centipede stuck his grinning face through a hole in the ceiling and shouted, I've done it! We're off! We're off! The others cried. We're off! The journey begins, shouted the centipede. And who knows where it will end, muttered the earthworm. If you have anything to do with it, it can only mean trouble. Nonsense, said the ladybird. We are now about to visit the most marvelous places and see the most wonderful things. Isn't that so, centipede? There is no knowing what we shall see, cried the centipede. We may see a creature with 49 heads who lives in the desolate snow. And whenever he catches a cold, which he dreads, he has 49 noses to blow. We may see the venomous pink spotted scrunch who can chew up a man with one bite. It likes to eat five of them roasted for lunch and 18 for its supper at night. We may see a dragon and nobody knows that we won't see a unicorn there. We may see a terrible monster with toes growing out of tufts of his hair. We may see the sweet little bitty bright hen, so playful, so kind and well-bred. And such beautiful eggs, you just boil them and then they explode and they blow off your head. A new and a noceros, surely you'll see, and that ginormous, and that normous and norable gnat whose sting when it stings you goes in at the knee and comes out through the top of your hat. We may even get lost and be frozen by frost. We may die in an earthquake or tremor. Or nastier still, we may even be tossed on the horns of a furious dilemma. But who cares? Let us go from this horrible hill. Let us roll, let us bowl, let us plunge. Let's go rolling and bowling and spinning until... We're away from old Spiker and Sponge. <clears throat> One second later, slowly, insidiously, and most, oh, most gently, the great peach started to lean forward and steal into motion. The whole room began to tilt over 
and all the furniture went sliding across the room, across the floor, and crashed against the far wall. So did James and the ladybird and the old green grasshopper and Miss Spider and the earthworm and also the centipede who had just come from sli come slithering quickly down the wall. Chapter 15 Outside in the garden at that very moment, Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker had just taken their places at the front gate, each with a bunch of tickets in her hand. And the first stream of early morning sightseers was visible in the distance, climbing up the hill to view the peach. We shall make a fortune today, Aunt Spiker was saying. Just look at all those people. I wonder what became of that horrid little boy of ours last night, Aunt Sponge said. He never did come back in, did he? He probably fell down in the dark and broke his leg, Aunt Spiker said. Or his neck, maybe, Aunt Sponge said hopefully. Just wait till I get my hands on him, Aunt Spiker said, waving her cane. He'll never want to stay out all night again by the time I've finished with him. Good gracious me, what's that awful noise? Both women swung round to look. The noise, of course, had been caused by the giant peach crashing through the fence that surrounded it. And now, gathering speed every second, it came rolling across the garden towards the place where Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker were standing. They gaped. They screamed. They started to run. They panicked. They both got in each other's way. They began pushing and jostling, and each one of them was thinking only about saving herself. Aunt Sponge, the fat one, tripped over a box that she'd brought along to keep that money keep the money in and fell flat on her face. Aunt Spiker immediately tripped over Aunt Sponge and came down on top of her. They both lay on the ground fighting and clawing and yelling and struggling frantically to get up again. But before they could do this, the mighty peach was upon them. There was a crunch and then there was silence. The peach rolled on and behind it, Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spike, Spiker lay ironed out upon the grass as flat and thin and lifeless as a couple of paper dolls cut out of a picture book. 16. And now the peach had broken out of the garden and was over the edge of the hill, rolling and bouncing down the steep slope at a terrific pace. Faster and faster and faster it went. And the crowds of people who were climbing up the hill suddenly caught sight of this terrible monster plunging down upon them. And they screamed and scattered to, the, to right and left as it went hurtling by. At the bottom of the hill, it charged across the road, knocking over a telegraph pole and flattening two parked cars as it went by. Then it rushed madly across about 20 fields breaking down all the fences and hedges in its path. It went right through the middle of a herd of fine Jersey cows, and then through a flock of sheep, and then through a paddock full of horses, and then through a yard full of pigs. And soon the whole countryside was a seething mass of panic-stricken animals stampeding in all directions. The peach was still going at a tremendous speed, with no sign of slowing down. And about a mile farther on, it came to a village. Down the main street of the village, it rolled, with people leaping frantically out of its path right and left. And at the end of the street, it went crashing right through the wall of an enormous building and out the other side, leaving two gaping round holes in the brickwork. <clears throat> this building happened to be a famous factory where they made chocolate and almost at once, a great river of warm melted chocolate came pouring out of the holes in the factory wall. A minute later, this brown sticky mess was flowing through every street in the village, oozing under the doors of houses and into people's shops and gardens. Children were waiting in there, wading in it up to their knees, and some were even trying to swim in it. And all of them were sucking it into their mouths in great greedy gulps and shrieking with joy. But the peach rushed on across the countryside, on and on and on, 
leaving a trail of destru destruction in its wake. Cow sheds, stables, pigsties, barns, bungalows, hayricks. Anything that got in its way went toppling over like a nine pin. An old man sitting quietly beside a stream had, a fish, had his fishing rod whisked out of his hands as it went dashing by. And a woman called Daisy in Twistle was standing so close to it as it passed that she had the skin taken off the tip of her nose. Would it ever stop? Why should it? A round object will always keep rolling as long as it is on a downhill slope. And in this case, the land sloped downhill all the way until it reached the ocean. The same ocean that James had begged his aunts to be allowed to visit the day before. Well, perhaps he was going to visit it now. The peach was rushing closer and closer to it every second, and closer and also to the towering white cliffs that came first. These cliffs are the most famous in the whole of England, and they are hundreds of feet high. Below them, the sea is deep and cold and hungry. Many ships have been swallowed up and lost forever on this part of the coast and all the men who were in them as well. The peach was now only a hundred yards away from the cliff. Now 50, now 20, now 10, now five. And when it reached the edge of the cliff, it seemed to leap in, up into the sky and hang there suspended for a few seconds, still turning over and over in the air. Then it began to fall down. Down, 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 down. Snap! It hit the water with a colossal splash and sank like a stone. But a few seconds later, up it came, and this time up it stayed, floating serenely upon the surface.